Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Alan Cobb, thank you for that very nice introduction. And I want to thank the Pachyderm Club here in Wichita for inviting me and my son Eric to spend some time with you. I guess he spoke here four years ago, and I'm proud to uh, be here now and also to have the tie-in with the other Pachyderm Clubs from th throughout the country. Uh, I had the great honor and privilege to serve the people of Iowa as governor. So a uh, former governor Collier, it's good to be here with you. He was telling me that he and our present governor, Kim Reynolds, were very close friends when they were lieutenant governors together. And Kim, in, in Iowa, we used to elect the governor and lieutenant governors separately. So when I was first elected in 82, I followed a long-term uh, term successful governor, Governor Robert Ray, we were elected separately. And my first two terms were difficult times for Republicans and uh, Democrats uh, ended up controlling both houses of the legislature and the lieutenant governor. Uh, we then amended the constitution so the governor and lieutenant governor are elected as a team and the lieutenant governor moved from being president of the Senate to being part of the executive branch of state government. And so I had that experience for two terms uh, and then I left the governor's office and went to the private sector, was with a, well, I, I, I taught a, a leadership course at the University of Iowa for a brief period of time, and then I passed the Series 7 securities exam and became a financial advisor with Robert W. Baird and then was invited to become the president of a medical school in Des Moines, Des Moines University, and I did that for over six years. And then a couple of law students at Drake University uh, recruited me to come back and run for governor again against a, a liberal a Democrat governor that was driving the state into debt. And uh, I gave up a job that president of the medical school that paid three times as much as governor to come back because I loved the state. And uh, I'm proud to say uh, that I defeated the incumbent by 10 points and in 2010 came back and then had the honor of serving two more terms. So in, I ended up serving before, and then of course, President Trump, um, my son of course deserves a lot of credit because Iowa had gone for the Democrat for president in every election since Reagan 86 with the exception of when George W, George, W. Bush won for re-election by a very slim margin. 10,000 10, votes in 2004. Uh, and then, of course, Obama carried the state uh, twice, but then in 2000, so I came back in 2010 and won re-election in 2014, and then in, in 2016, uh, my son who had headed up the uh, uh, the uh, Renewable Fuel Alliance to educate all presidential candidates of both parties about the importance of renewable energy uh, was, and, and I was a leader in ethanol, biodiesel, and wind energy, and uh, he got Donald Trump to go to an ethanol plant and then go to our Renewable Fuel Summit and become a strong supporter of ethanol, and, and after he lost uh, the Iowa caucuses to Cruz by a small margin, uh, he said, I want to get rid of the guy that ran that operation and hire Eric Branstead. And Eric uh, deserves a lot of credit because Trump carried Iowa twice, uh, carried 93 of the 99 counties, uh, and won the state by 8 or 9 percent. So. 9.1. Well, well it's, it's not, in 2016, it's 9.1, but every time he would talk to the president, he would raise. He would say it was 10. <laughs> or 11, or 12. <laughs> But the good news is Eric became a very close friend of the president and I think he informed the president that I had, as governor, in my first term, hosted a young man from China who at that time was only a county level, a party secretary in Hebei province, the sister state to Iowa, 
Uh, so I hosted Xi Jinping in his first trip to America in 1985. And we had signed a sister state in 83, my first year as governor. I had taken a delegation to Hebei, in, in, to both Beijing and Hebei in 1984. Now, the difference between China in 1984 and now was, first of all, there were no tall buildings. Everybody's riding bicycles. We rode an old coal-fired steam locomotive from Beijing to Shishaijuang. But we were greeted there very well. A band gave my wife a big bouquet of flowers, and uh, we were there for the 35th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic. And so that was in the fall of 1984. In the spring of 85, I was notified we have a delegation from our sister state coming. So we said, we're going to go all out to really show our friendliness and hospitality to these uh, young Chinese ag delegation. And there's a picture taken behind my desk, April 29th, 1985, with me and Xi Jinping and his own delegation. And then I assigned a young man named Luca Baroni, an Italian immigrant, who escorted him all over Iowa. And they visited farms and factories, went to a birthday party, went to a barbecue, uh, stayed with the Dvorak family, stayed in uh, Gary Dvorak's uh, bedroom in Muscatine, Iowa. And um, made, we made a very good impression, so much so that, so I was governor for 16 years, I had a 12-year sabbatical, was president of the medical school, and they came back and recruited me to run one more time. <coughs> yeah, can you get me some water? So, in 19, in, in 2009, a couple of law students at Drake University started a movement on Facebook for me to run for governor again. Now, they weren't old enough to vote, and Facebook didn't exist when I was governor before, but they got 10,000 people to sign up, including my kids who, when they were teenagers, hated the fact their dad was governor because of all the scrutiny they had to live with. But now they're all on board for it. And um, everybody except my wife thought it was a great idea. <laughs> she said, why would you give up a job that pays three times as much where you don't take all the abuse you have as governor. But I loved Iowa and being governor so much that I said, I'm going to do it. I know I have to come back, win a tough primary, and beat an incumbent in the general election. We did all of that. And, uh, and then I got a chance. By that time, we had changed the law. So the governor and lieutenant governor elected as a team. The governor is nominated by primary, but then the party convention chooses the lieutenant governor. And I made a recommendation of a woman named Kim Reynolds who has spent 14 years as a county treasurer. I was so impressed with her leadership of the county treasurer's group in Iowa. And one of the things she did was we had a, a committee to reform state government to reduce the size and cost of state government. One of their, and they had a lot of good recommendations which we adopted. One of them, which wasn't very well liked, was to reduce the number of driver's license stations. It used to be that the um, DOT would go around to the counties and one half a day every two weeks, if you lived in a rural county, you could get your driver's license or get it renewed. They were suggesting that we reduce the number and you'd have to drive 100 miles to get your driver's license renewed. You can imagine how well that all went over in rural Iowa. But Kim Reynolds came up with the idea, we could do that in the county treasurer's office. We already do vehicle registration. We could do that. Is all we need is the machines to do the eye test, and we could do it with the existing staff. It would cost less, and we can offer it uh, five days a week, you know, the regular hours. And the DOT said, no, they couldn't possibly do that. So we did a task force. Uh, so we, we designated six rural counties. It went over so well, we're now doing it, I think, in 84 counties in Iowa. And, and, and that was just one of many things she did. She made it possible for people to uh, pay their taxes uh, online and things like that. And I was so impressed with her 
knowledge. And then, and then I kept encouraging her to run for the state senate. She got elected to the state senate, and she'd been in the senate a couple of years uh, when I became the nominee for governor. And so I said, and she knew more about the budget than Chet Culver, who was the incumbent governor by far. So I asked her to be my lieutenant governor. We ran as a team. We did everything together. And I'm proud to say that when President Trump chose me to be ambassador and then I had to go through confirmation, once I was confirmed, I had to resign. So I resigned to become the ambassador to China and she became the governor. She was reelected in 2018. She's up for reelection in 2022. She's doing a great job. She has. She's kept the schools open. Uh, she's avoided some of the crazy lockdown that the Democratic governors have done in other states. And Iowa is fiscally in the strongest position it's ever been. And she is leading the effort to reduce taxes and, 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 and make Iowa even more competitive. So I'm really proud to have been a mentor and to help facilitate her leadership. We. <coughs> we also elected uh, in 2014 uh, Joni Ernst to the Senate, and last time they spent 1.9 million dollars trying to beat her. A uh, huge amount of money. I think you had a similar situation here in Kansas, where the Democrats just flooded the state with all kinds of liberal out-of-state money trying to win the Senate seat. And of course, uh, Joni was reelected. And so, okay, now I wanna get on to the responsibility of being ambassador to China. Uh, I love being governor and it was a tough decision, but when the President of the United States asks you to take on the job of being the ambassador to our biggest rival and the and, and you know the second biggest economy in the world, uh, and our and our biggest competitor, it's pretty hard to say no. So I was proud, and plus I had a great lieutenant governor who I knew would carry on and and provide wonderful leadership. So I chose to accept that uh, invitation to be the ambassador. I was confirmed uh, with only 13 dissenting votes, mainly Democrats who wanted to run for president, but. Uh, uh, the good news was um, I went to China in a very difficult time in 2017. That was at the time that the North Koreans were doing nuclear tests and shooting off missiles threatening the United States. And I'm proud to say that President Trump had the courage to take them on and we were able to uh, get, uh, with the help of Nikki Haley in the United Nations, uh, resolutions to put sanctions on North Korea. And uh, I was in Tumen, China, on the border with North Korea three days after the last nuclear test. And let me tell you, the Chinese don't like North Korea having nuclear weapons any more than we do. They're next door. They're very fearful. If you do have a war with, with North Korea, they'll be inundated with uh, refugees, and they're frankly fearful that they could even be hit with nuclear weapons. So uh, we need to continue to work with them and with everybody else in the UN Security Council to continue the sanctions on North Korea and eventually get the need denuclearization done. In addition to that, when I went through confirmation, I heard from senators of both parties the devastating effect of fentanyl and the deaths that it caused all over this country. And most of it originates in China. And so we made the effort to make all of fentanyl a controlled substance in China. We even had a congressional delegation led by uh, Lamar Alexander, and, and we brought that to the attention of the Chinese leadership. And then I went to the Oval Office and I asked President Trump when he met with Xi Jinping in Buenos Aires, make a personal request that he makes all of fentanyl a controlled substance. He did. Xi Jinping followed through and did that. In May 1 of 2018, they made all of fentanyl a controlled substance in China. We've seen much less direct shipment, almost none from China since that time. 
The other big issue, of course, was the unfair treatment we've had on trade. We helped China become members of the World Trade Organization in 2001, and they promised to do all kinds of things to reform and open up their economy and to provide fairness and reciprocity in trade, which they failed to do through several administrations. Trump came in, and I want to give Mike Pompeo some real credit, because as Secretary of State, he worked closely with the Trump administration to insist on fairness and reciprocity from China. Also, Ambassador Lighthizer and Secretary Mnuchin, especially Lighthizer, really focused on getting a fair and good trade agreement. It was a long, hard battle. I was in on many of those meetings, both in China and back here in the United States. Finally, in January of 2020, the phase one of the trade agreement was signed. It does restrict China from stealing technology, and it does provide some protection for intellectual property, some things that were long overdue and should have been done years before. In addition, it dramatically increases their purchase of both uh, agriculture products and manufactured goods, including aircraft. And that's very important to your economy here. It's very important to our economy throughout the Midwest. And if you followed what's happened in the last several months, China has purchased record amounts of corn, soybeans, beef, and, and, and chicken in addition to pork. They were already purchasing a significant amount of pork. But now, as a result of that, and being from an agricultural state like Iowa, we are now experiencing the highest corn and soybean prices we've ever seen in history. And so I give a lot of credit to Trump for putting in place the tariffs, which are still there, and I hope the administration keeps them, because that's what got the Chinese attention, and then was able to negotiate a trade agreement. And Lighthizer not only did the trade agreement with China, but with Japan, South Korea, and with Canada and Mexico, and all of that has made a real difference. The time in China was an interesting experience, and one of the worst things that happened was the virus which started in Wuhan. And uh, I know that Mike Pompeo and, and Dr. Redfield, who used to be the head of the, the CDC, both feel that it was from that lab and members of the employees of that lab that became sick and I think began that what became a worldwide pandemic. Why did it become a worldwide pandemic? It, I think, could have been controlled in Wuhan, but what happened, they had this big Chinese New Year celebration in Wuhan. Some people tell me they thought they were going to break the Guinness Rick, uh, rec uh, record for the number of people attending a banquet. Thousands of people attended a banquet in January of 2020, and then for Chinese New Year, they go all over the world. And that's what spread it and made it into a worldwide pandemic. And of course, the loss of lives and the economic impact throughout the world has been devastating. And the Chinese to this day refuse to acknowledge or admit that it originated from Wuhan, China. And they try to blame everybody else, American soldiers that came to the military games in Wuhan that fall to people from Europe, from Italy, or elsewhere, but it is ridiculous. And of course, uh, they have, they kept, we offered the CDC to come in to help on that for months. They would not return our phone calls. And they, we got no help from them. We got no response. And, and then of course, uh, they were able to intimidate the WHO into not coming in for a year. And then when they did, uh, they basically controlled uh, the report that they would make, which is a whitewash and fails to acknowledge the truth. So it is a difficult and challenging time. China is a rising power. They believe their totalitarian communist system is superior to the democratic systems in other parts of the world. And they're convinced because their ability to control that uh, they will lead the world. 
Xi Jinping. Now, I'm an old friend of Xi Jinping. I hosted him. I treated him well. He treated me and my family well when we arrived. He, and I presented my credentials. He said, I want to host, and this is almost unprecedented. He said, I want to host you and your family for dinner with my wife and I. He did that. He, his wife, and his daughter. And my wife and I, our daughter, who's still teaching there at the International School of Beijing, her husband, and two granddaughters. And we had dinner with him. It was very cordial and very nice. But the policies that he's put in place, he has doubled down on Chinese Communist Party's control of China. And you know, they spend a lot on national defense. They spend even more on internal security. There is no freedom of speech, no freedom of assembly. And if you, and, and there is so much um, surveillance that anybody that speaks out or says something critical of President Xi or the Communist Party is probably not going to be heard from again. They're probably going to go to prison or whatever. And so that's what happens. Even Jack Ma, the head of Alibaba, I think disappeared for three months uh, because of something that he said. So it's a very difficult situation. You've seen what's happened in Hong Kong. Uh, there was supposed to be one country, two systems, where they'd have freedom of speech and assembly. But when they started having demonstrations against uh, the communist rule, uh, they passed a new law that takes away freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and even the independent judiciary that they had. Uh, now you can be, even if you don't, even if you're not a resident of Hong Kong, if you're a foreigner living there and you say something critical of Xi Jinping or the Communist Party, you could be shipped off to China in the last you'd ever hear of. And of course, you've probably heard what they've done to the Uyghurs out in Xinjiang province in Northwest China. This is a Muslim group. Uh, they're basically, it's uh, what, what I guess you'd call ethnic cleansing. They're trying to wipe out their religion and their uh, culture and make them loyal communists. Their system is so different than ours. This is why I'm concerned about us not teaching America's youth about the proud history that we have and the freedoms and the opportunities we have as Americans. Because the Chinese love to talk about the fact that they have 5,000 year written history and they had all these dynasties. And I'll tell you, they look at Xi Jinping as the present emperor. They considered the Chinese emperors and they always had strong emperors and if they weren't they got overthrown and then they had a new emperor and, and and Xi Jinping is just the latest in terms of and he's looked at as an emperor who can do no wrong and nobody dares question anything that he does I won't say that he's all everything he's done has been bad because he's cracked down on corruption in the Communist Party he's addressing the problems they have with air pollution in Beijing but they still haven't addressed the problems they have with polluting the groundwater by the use of MTBE, which is a carcinogenic and been banned in this country and every state, I think, for 14 years. And there's a lot of issues that they're not addressing. But uh, there's no question that uh, their primary interest is to maintain their one-party control and their authoritarian uh, government. And, and that is unfortunate. But uh, I, I think under, uh, under President Trump, and especially with uh, Mike Pompeo as the Secretary of State, we insisted on fairness and reciprocity in the relationship when they were using their consulate in, in um, Houston to spy on us, we closed their consulate. Of course, they retaliated by closing our consulate in Chengdu. But, that's the way the Chinese operate. Well, with that, let me open it for your questions. I'm honored to be here. Yes, sir. We'll do back here, members first, and please keep questions, not statements. Okay. Thank you for your comments. What should be the American policy and action today with regard 
to Beijing's obvious desire to take over Taiwan? Well, we have had the Taiwan Relations Act ever since we recognized uh, mainland China as, as the official, you know, so we have the embassy in, in Beijing, we rec but we have unofficial recognition of Taiwan, and we've provided military assistance and support to Taiwan. We do significant trade with them. We need to continue that. Taiwan has become a democratic country. They've done some great things. They're a great ally of ours, and we need to do everything we can to assure that we support them and we will continue to supply them. The big concern we have, the Chinese military buildup in the South China Sea and the fact they're invading, they're using their, their Navy and their Air Force to threaten the future of Taiwan. Xi Jinping clearly wants to have Taiwan under control of the mainland while he's still the leader of China. So that's something we need to be keenly aware of and we need to do everything we can. Now, we have supported them ever since diplomatic recognition in 1979 and it's worked. But I think the threat to Taiwan is greater today than it's ever been. Okay, next question. So, like <coughs> the media, you know, Barack, Barack, you know, right? They claim Barack belongs to them, but it's part of India not China, they claim it belongs to them. What's your opinion about Ladakh? I, I didn't totally understand your you know, question. Ladakh, Ladakh is a part of Kashmir. Ladakh, L-A-D-A-K-H, Ladakh, is a part of Kashmir. And China thinks it belongs to them. Yeah, China thinks a lot of things belong to them. <laughs> In, including, you know, there's been some conflicts on the border with, uh, with India as well. And, and, and India has always been a neutral country, but they're moving more in our direction because they recognize the real threat from China. We, we have uh, really tried to work to build, a, and there has already been a, um, there has been a, uh, a meeting of India, Australia, Japan, and the United States. And we need to work with all of those countries. Uh, those are the big countries in the neighborhood. Uh, and we need to work with the ASEAN countries as well to counter the threat from China. Because China is the big bully in, in uh, Southeast Asia. Next question over here. Thank you for joining us today, sir. Uh, do you think that there's a chance that this Wuhan flu was maybe no accident, that it was a result of our government poking the bear, in this case the dragon, in terms of trade policies and tariffs uh, and military uh, exercises in that part of the world that they want to prove to the world that who is in charge? I, I don't know. I don't think it's purposeful. I, I believe that as Pompeo and Dr. Redfield and others uh, feel, and, and, and they have more access to that information than I had as ambassador, but that it did come from the lab, but it probably came from people that worked in the lab becoming infected and then infecting other people. Uh, I don't think it was purposeful, but obviously it was very dangerous. And the thing that's so tragic is the cover-up. And this is the problem with the Chinese communist system. People at the local level don't dare deliver bad news to Xi Jinping or to the leaders in Beijing because they know what will happen to them. They'll be gone. They may be killed or imprisoned. You'll never hear from them again. That's exactly what happened to the mayor of Wuhan. That's what happened to the party secretary and the governor of uh, Hubei province. And th so they did everything they could. They even got the doctors that discovered it to renege on what they had said in order to try to cover it up. But eventually it just got to the point where they, they couldn't cover it up anymore. Uh, but I, I don't think it was purposeful. I don't know. I don't know that we'll ever know because they did such an elaborate cover up and kept uh, 
people from RCDC and from WHO and everybody out of there for such a long period of time that I don't think we'll ever know. But th that's a sad part of it. If we knew more about the origin of this, we could maybe prevent future pandemics. And that that is a very critical thing. And, and I know there are Republican members of Congress that are pushing the Biden administration to dig into this and to really try to find out where this uh, originated and, and, and how it happened. But uh, I think it's going to be very difficult after this long period of time to really find that out. Okay, next question. Ambassador, thanks for joining us. Uh, I know that China imports most of its oil. Is there some way that we can have some influence over them by dealing with that? Yes, I can tell you we worked really hard during the Trump administration to try to prevent China from importing oil from Iran. And we did that with countries all over the world. And we made real progress. I don't think we were able to totally shut it off. And the part of the problem was uh, China um, financed some of Iran's uh, oil production. And so they wanted to get paid back for the money that they had spent on that. And that was part of the delicacy in the negotiations. But we worked really hard, and it was making great progress. That's my great fear with John Kerry being part of this administration. The deal that he worked out with Iran was probably the worst international deal of all time. And yes. And, and that's where the Trump administration did the right thing. And instead of dealing with Iran, they worked with the other Arab countries and got peace agreements with Israel, I think with four other Arab countries. And frankly, there's more of them. Saudi Arabia and other Arab countries, I think, are inclined to want to do that as well. But this administration is enamored with working out some kind of a deal with Iran. We cannot trust Iran. They are dangerous, they're developing nuclear weapons, and even if they promise they're not going to do it, they'll do it anyway, and, and, and they're really a big threat, not only to Israel, but to the other uh, neighbors there in that region. And that's where I think uh, the Trump administration, instead of trying to work out some kind of a deal with the Palestinians, they worked out a deal with these other Arab countries and that's the direction I think we've got to continue to go in the future. Good afternoon, sir. Would you please expound on China's aggressive policy of infrastructure um, projects across the globe, and in particular the Western Hemisphere? They have something that Xi Jinping initiated when he became the leader of China called the Belt and Road Initiative. They are spending hundreds of billions of dollars all over. It started in places like Pakistan and in Southeast Asia, but now they're doing it in Africa, in South America. They're doing it in um, Asia. They're doing it in Europe. And part of our problem in trying to get Muslim or Islamic countries to criticize the mistreatment of the Uyghurs is they are threatened by China's economic uh, power and, and, and what, all the money they're doing to buy friends through this Belt and Road Project. In some instances, though, uh, they have gotten countries into real big debt. And then the Chinese have then said, well, it's all right if you turn over your port to us, uh, you know, we'll you know, you, you can, that's how you can pay the debt. So that's something we've got to watch out for, is China using its, and, and they love to say, and I call them on this all the time, oh, we're just a developing country. Well, that was true 20 and 30 years ago. Today, they are the wealthiest country in the world. They have, they have more billionaires than we have. They have more luxury cars on the streets of Beijing than I've seen in any, in any city I've been in in America. I can tell you that China is a wealthy, aggressive, one-party, 
authoritarian country. And now they're even going to control their people by, they, they have the most facial recognition uh, in, in the world and uh, surveillance. And then if you don't follow the, the line of the Communist Party, uh, or you say something critical to Xi Jinping, you may not be able to get a ticket to go on a high-speed train or to go on an airplane or to get a visa. So this is the direction they're going. They call it social scoring. If you don't have the right score, if you're not considered a loyal uh, communist, or you're or, or loyal, whether you're a member of the Communist Party or not, doesn't really matter if you've got to be loyal to Xi Jinping and the leadership of China. It's so different. There is no freedom of speech or assembly. Yes? Yeah, do you see them becoming a reserve currency for the world? They would like to be. Uh, they would like to be the reserve currency for the world. They would like to displace the United States in that area as they'd like to displace the United States in a lot of other areas. There's no question that Xi Jinping's vision for China is that they be wealthy, militarily the superior, and uh, respected. I kept telling them, you can't be respected if you don't live by the rules that the rest of the world lives by. But that's what they, that's what they aspire to be. And the uh, currency is just one of the many things. Welcome, Ambassador. Thank um, you. What is the U.S. policy towards China's expansion, specifically with the Philippines and the Philippine Seas? And then if you could also um, address their fishing fleets that are constantly in other people's waters. Well, the South China Sea, and this started actually back during the uh, Obama administration, they started taking these areas, uh, the South China Sea where sometimes they were above water level and sometimes not, and built islands, and then they militarized those islands, and then they have something they call the Nine Dash Line, they say that's just part of China. This is international waters. And Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam, many other countries have claims there too. But China is the big bully in the region and they claim it's theirs. Now we, what we've done is we have what we call freedom of navigation and we send our ships through that area on a regular basis to say this is international waters. 30% of the world trade goes through there and we want to make sure that it's protected. But it is a concern, and it is an area that the Chinese have been very aggressive with. They promised, they promised the Obama administration they wouldn't militarize it, they have. And I've seen the pictures of what they've done with building those islands and now, and now militarizing those islands. So it is a concern, and the same thing is true. Uh, they're using their um, Coast Guard basically uh, to threaten the fishing of other countries in those international waters. So it's a big problem. As, a, as an American, you're in a unique position to have seen the chairman from the time he was a student yes. to the time he's an absolute leader. And what are the marked changes you've seen as him, in him as a man? Well, we were very hopeful that he would be a reformer and that he would follow in the direction of Deng Xiaoping, who said it's okay to become an entrepreneur, to make money, and, and whatever. His father was, a, was a, uh, a, a provincial leader at that time and was also a reformer. Unfortunately, since Xi Jinping became the leader of China, he's gone the other way. He's become more authoritarian. He's given the Communist Party more control over the economy. He's also done some things that have been popular with the people, such as cracking down on corruption in the Communist Party, which is a huge problem, and also addressing some of the air pollution issues, uh, but, uh, and also raising people out of poverty. And that's one of the things that they use. Uh, just think how bad it was. Uh, during Mao Zedong, they had uh, the great leap forward, and 25 to 30 million people died of starvation and it was never reported. And then you had 
the uh, Cultural Revolution where they closed the colleges and universities and sent the professors and the students out to work uh, as peasants in the fields. Uh, Xi Jinping lived through that. And that's why we were hopeful that he would really want to continue the policies of reform and opening up. But what happened is, after Tiananmen and after the fall of the Soviet Union, the Chinese communists said, we're never going to let this happen here. We're going to crack down on any assembly or any demonstration that could be a threat. And consequently, uh, it's become more authoritarian. And that's the disappointment. Uh, Xi Jinping, personally, is very nice. And uh, he's very well spoken. Uh, he, he always used an interpreter, but I think he understands a lot of English as well. But uh, uh, the direction he's leading China, his vision is for China to be the far and away leader politically, economically, militarily in the world. And they are moving that way, and they are moving that way very aggressively. They're even trying to use the pandemic, which started in Wuhan, China, and, and the way they've managed it. Of course, they've managed it in a very authoritarian, heavy-handed way, but it has prevented a uh, significant spread. And in fact, if you want to go to China today, you have a three-week quarantine. So it's very difficult. Um, I think we're out of time, so. Oh, you're, you're good. Okay. One, okay. one more question. I, I have a. Thank you for your time, Mr. Ambassador. Just one quick question. Given the large amount of trade that takes place between uh, those two countries, what would be what would be your recommendations in order to achieve some kind of balance? Because they are a large client of, of ours, and we also uh, trade. China so what would be cannot feed themselves. They need, and America has the best quality and reliability in terms of food. So American food, whether it's Quaker Oats or McDonald's or whether it's uh, uh, Hormel Meats, very well liked among the Chinese consumers. So, and, and they need it. As they're trying to rebuild their pork herd, they need corn and soybeans to feed those pigs. They raise half the pigs in the world. That's their number one choice of, of protein is pork. So we, they need us and, and we need them in terms of being customers. Uh, but we want fairness and reciprocity in trade. And we want to make sure that they're not stealing our technology as they have historically done for so long. And we want to see intellectual property rights protected. But as they become more entrepreneurial and have more of their own companies, it's in their interest also to protect intellectual property rights from people stealing what uh, Chinese inventors come up with. So uh, I'm hopeful that, and I think Lighthizer did a great job of getting us the, the uh, phase one of the trade agreement. I hope we can go on. There's more things we want to do in phase two, including stopping the Chinese from subsidizing their state-owned companies. That really distorts the market it's unfair, but it's an even bigger challenge than what we've got them to agree to so far. We need to enforce what we have in the phase one agreement, and we need to continue to push for more. Thank you very much.